Hi, this is Jeremy Webster with Collector's Maze, and I am here with Gary K. Wolf, who is the originator of the original Roger Rabbit character. Gary, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing just fine. Thank you for having me. So not a lot of us can say that we've had a creation that has had certainly the cultural impact <laughs> of, of, of a Roger Rabbit. Where did, uh, where did Roger Rabbit's whole... <sighs> Well, it, it, it started a long, long time ago. You have to you have to know a little bit about my background. You have to know a little bit about where I grew up. And you have to know a little bit about my parents. Um, I, I grew up in a little farm town in Illinois called Earlville, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, 1,400 people. There were 100 kids total in my whole school. And... Um, uh, I was in the second or third grade, I can't remember which, and our teacher gave us as an assignment, a picture to color. And the whole object of the exercise was to stay inside the lines. That was, that was the whole object of the exercise. Uh, so I took that picture home that night, got out my Crayolas and I looked at it and it was a picture of a farmhouse, uh, a barn, uh, a fence, a, uh, a, a meadow, and a cow out in the middle of the meadow mm -hmm. myself. And a you know, pretty typical Illinois farm scene for a coloring book. So I, you know, I colored, I colored the grass green and I colored the, the fence brown and I colored the farmhouse yellow because that's the color farmhouses were around Robo. Barn red, you know, stayed inside the lines, whoop, right on, so pristine. And then I get to the cow. And I'm looking at the cow and the cow is all alone out there in the middle of the field. And it looks like a pretty sad, lonely cow to me. So my mother had always told me that when people were alone, you know, they got sad, they got lonely and they got blue. So I said, hmm, you know, it works for people, it must work for cows. So I colored the cow blue. And, I, and then the next day I turned my picture in. Uh, I go home, come back the day after that. And the teacher passes out. All of the pictures, all of them except for mine. And she says to me, Gary, she said, would you would you come up here to the to the front of the class? And I, I thought to myself, Oh my God, I stayed inside the lines better than anybody. So she said, Gary, turn around and face the class. So I turned around, and I faced the class, and she put that picture up over my head. And she said, Class, she said, look at this stupid, stupid picture. She said, Everybody knows that cows are brown. Cows are black, cows are white. Sometimes cows are brown, black, and white, all three. It's just never, never, never are cows blue. It's just Gary, don't you ever do anything that stupid again. Wow. So she called my mother and <laughs> told my mother, uh, she, my mother had to go to school. And I mean, for my mother, this was a big deal. And my uh -huh. mother had to go to school. And the teacher told her, she said, I think there's something wrong with Gary. I think we might have to send him to a psychiatrist. So, uh, which was a really out of out, out, way out concept in Earlville, Illinois, in those days. So you got that, all that from a blue cow. Yeah, really tough love. So, um, <laughs> so that night, uh, that night, my folks called me in and sat me down in the living room, and my mother said to me. Gary, why did you color that cow blue? And I, I said, well, Ma, you know, it really, it was, it was you. You were the one who told me, you know, that people, they get sad and lonely, they got blue. And, you know, I saw the cow sad and lonely, I colored the cow blue. Mm -hmm. And so my mom said, all right, Gary, you go outside and play. Your dad and I are going to talk about this. So I went outside to play. Now, you have to know my, my mother and my father, uh, they were children of the depression. My dad had to drop out of school in the third grade to go to work during the depression. He now ran the pool hall in Arrowville, Illinois. My mother had to drop out of school in the eighth grade to go to work during the depression. And she now worked in the uh, school cafeteria. So these were not what you would call today upscale urban liberals. I mean, these were right. hard scrabble working folk who had had minimal education um and i you know, me playing outside in the front yard i didn't think this was going to have a happy ending so 
You know, finally my mom opened the door, called me back in, sat me down, says, you know, she says, Gary, she says, your father and I thought about this. And we thought about what you said. And we decided that the next time you want to color a cow blue, you go ahead and color a cow blue. <laughs> and, that, and that was like the best piece of advice I ever got in my life. It was also the first time anybody had validated my creativity. Uh, and so my mother called the teacher and told her next time he wants to color a cow blue, well, I'm color cow blue. So uh, I don't know, two or three weeks later, uh, we got another assignment and it was to write uh, a, a two page story about what you did on your summer vacation. And so kids were writing about uh, going to uh, like Namakagan up in Wisconsin or the Wisconsin Dells or, uh, you know, going to Starved Rock State Park or mm -hmm. uh, you know, wherever they were going. And for my two page story, I wrote this two page short story about how I went out into my backyard and I used tin cans and aluminum foil and I built a rocket ship and flew it to the moon. And the teacher the next day just laid it on my desk and said, well, that was interesting. I hope you had a good time. <laughs> and so, um, it, you know, I, 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 I went on and colored a lot of cows blue in, in, in the next, uh, the next couple of decades. And, um, I, I started writing, I, I started writing short stories first because I was, uh, I was just enamored of science fiction and, uh, there was a big market for short stories in those days. There were a lot of pulp magazines, a lot of short story science fiction anthologies. Mm -hmm. So I started writing short stories and, um, I realized that, uh, for every 12 short stories I wrote, I could write one novel and probably, you know, make a lot more money. So I, I wrote a novel. Um, my agent said it, who wouldn't handle short stories, but said he would handle my novels. Mm -hmm. uh, he sent the novel to Doubleday and Doubleday bought it. And they gave me a contract for three more novels, what, whatever I wanted to write. You know? So uh, the first one was called Killer Bowl, mm -hmm. which is still my most popular science fiction novel uh, it, of the non Roger Rabbit Toontown writings. It, when I go to a science fiction convention, I am known as the guy that wrote Killer Bowl because it's it's famous and deservedly so it's really it's really good so uh my second novel uh was called a generation removed uh the third novel was called the resurrectionist and you know i i would write i, I wrote generation removed wrote the resurrectionist and i'm double day they published it and said okay you know keep them coming mm -hmm. so for the fourth novel i wanted to write something that really pushed the envelope, something that nobody had ever had ever done before, that nobody had ever even thought about. And again, you got to go back to my early days in Earlville. Um, and my mother, again, who uh, told me once, she said, you know, if you, if you want to get out of this town, you don't want to wind up living your life in a small town in Illinois, running your father's pool hall. The one thing you can do to make that happen is to read, read whatever, whatever you can read, 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 and that will get you out of this town. Uh, she got me a library card mm -hmm. uh, and I would, I would get library books, but I mean, I was a kid. What did I read? I read comic books. <laughs> I, would <go> down to, <laughs> I would go down to Andy Giles smoke shop and uh, B street smoke shop. And I would read as many as I could before he threw me out. Then I'd use my allowance to buy some more. And then I, trade uh, trade those with kids for for other ones and so I, I had this big love of of comic books and and of course cartoons because we had a movie theater in town and i used to love seeing the cartoons uh my other reading material of choice was what my dad read and I, I, as i say my dad uh my dad was not a big reader but he did enjoy a certain kind of a uh, certain kind of literature. He read two true crime magazines and okay. uh, those don't exist anymore. But back in the forties and early fifties, um, they were, they were pretty popular. And what these were, were actual, uh, they had actual stories of real crimes compete complete with pictures of the crime scene. And 
their the most popular, of course, were murders. So yeah. they would do a um, they would do a uh, an article on some some grisly murder, and they would show the corpse or corpses. And uh, it, if you saw uh, Road to Perdition, with Tom Hanks, uh, Jude Law played a photographer who photographed crime scenes for exactly that kind of magazine. And yeah. that's that's what my dad read. Uh, and of course, those were all over the house. And so I read them too. And my mother, God bless her, she never once said, you know, don't read those, they'll rot your brain. Uh, it's whatever I wanted to read as long as I read. So I read those. Luckily, uh, I discovered that there was a slightly better quality crime crime fiction. And I got into Dashiell Hammett, uh, uh, Raymond Chandler, uh, Mickey Spillane, uh, the, the hard-boiled private eyes. Private eye stuff, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, like, I um, like they had that show several years ago, and I, and I think particularly with a generation younger than you and I, uh, True Detective, and a lot of people at the time didn't know that True Detective was a magazine, you know, yeah. and, and they and they used that title from it. My grandparents had a um, selection of them that they that had some of their favorite stories in them mm -hmm. that they kept for years. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, so th 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 those are my two loves. I, I mean, I loved comic books, cartoons, and noir detective fiction. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, I want to I want to do a novel that combines those elements. And uh, that's easier said than done, you know. I mean, how do you combine those things? So, um, I was uh, I, I was thinking about it for a long time, and I was watching Saturday morning cartoons one Saturday morning uh, for research. I told my wife, you know, I just sit here watch this for research, <laughs> and I I became enamored not of the cartoons, which were pretty basic, um, and not 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 nearly as funny as the ones I remember seeing from the from the forties and fifties. But I, I became enamored of the commercials because I started to see cartoon characters like the Trix Rabbit, Captain Crunch, Snap, Crackle and Pop, Tony the Tiger. Uh, the, the, these were cartoon characters talking to real kids and nobody seemed to think that was odd. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, you know, what a, what a great idea for a book. What if you had a world where cartoon characters were real. What kind of a world would that be? So I spent a year just researching comic books, cartoons, and comic strips to see what kinds of things went on in comic strips that I could put into a real world for uh, humorous or uh, mystery purposes. And um, I, I, after a year's worth of research, I sat down, wrote the book. Uh, I, I came up with my hard-boiled private eye, Eddie Valiant. I named him after my father uh, to, to thank him for his setting me down the path and uh, um, produced the book. So uh, it, it was it was sensational. I mean, I, I read it and thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever read, probably the best thing I'd ever written. And uh, so I sent it to Doubleday. And of course, this was the fourth book in my four-book four deal. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in my writing career, short stories or novels, I got a reject. They rejected who censored Roger Rabbit. And so I called my editor and I said, Sharon, I said, why, why did you reject this? I said, this is clearly the best thing I've ever written. I said, maybe the best thing I'll ever write. Why, why did you reject me? So I agree. She said, it was, it was, it was hilarious and, and, and unusual and unique and, novel i've never read anything like this before but it was so different from anything you've written so different from anything anybody's ever written that i had to send it to the marketing department to get approval and it was them who rejected it so i called the marketing department i said you know charlie you know why did you reject my book he says oh he said we all thought it was really funny we all laughed but there's no category for this on the bookstore shelves it's not a it's not a regular adult novel. It's not a children's novel. It's not really fantasy. It's not really science fiction. There's no category for this on the shelf. I said, There's no place we can put it. I can't sell this book. And I said, OK, Charlie, what would you do if somebody today gave you Gulliver's Travels or Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz? 
what would you do with right. those? And he thought for a minute, he said, I couldn't sell those either. So I went to my agent and I said, I said, Bill, you know, if I, if I, if I can't sell this, he said, I don't want to be a writer anymore because this is what I want to write. He said, no, 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 don't worry about it. He said, we'll, we'll find it at home. So he started sending it out to other editors and, and other publishers. And um, it, it sometimes he would send it to several different editors at the same publisher because they had different, uh, different outlooks and different likes. Uh, uh, along the way, it, it got 110 rejects. It was rejected 110 times, always for the same reason. Uh, editors loved it. They sent it to the marketing department. Marketing department said, ah, can't sell this book. Um, and my, in those days, when you got rejects, they, they came to you in the mail. Yeah. And they didn't come by email like they, they, they do today. They came in the mail. And my wife used to call me going out to the mailbox every night, the daily disappointments, because I would go out and come back with mail five rejects in my hand um and, and finally um 111th submission it landed on the desk of a young woman named rebecca st martin and she was an editor uh, rebecca martin who was an editor at st martin's press and uh she had just published a big bestseller for them and so the president of st martin's uh gave her basically a vanity project he said all right next book you publish, you can publish any book you want. You know, you pick it, I'll publish it. And just at that time, Roger Rabbit came across her desk and she read it. And like all editors, she just loved it. So she went directly to the president of the company and said, here's the book, Vanity Project. You said I could publish anything, publish this. And he said, all right, I'm going to take it home. I'll read it tonight, Get back to you in the morning. So he went home, came back the next day, Call Rebecca into the office. She says, Rebecca, I told you you could publish anything you wanted, but you can't publish this because I can't sell it. <laughs> There's no category for it on the bookstore shelves. And Rebecca uh, stepped up to the plate and said, you told me you'd publish it, so you publish it or I quit. And by golly, they published it. Um, albeit in very, very small quantities. They, I think 5,000 copies, which is, I mean, nothing today um yeah. and and people people say to me uh you know if you could live your life over what would you do differently well if i could live my life over the one thing i would do differently is i would buy all five thousand of those copies because they sold for 299 and if you go on ebay today they're well <laughs> over 400 bucks so wow yeah the yeah Small run, yeah, those small run ones like that, they, they tend to shoot up quickly in price if it's a big property like well, that. Well, all especially especially when uh, um, they become a blockbuster movie. And, um, yeah. it, it, you know, the transition from book to movie, um, the book hadn't come out. I sold the book in 1980. And um, the book was scheduled to come out in 1981. It just took St. Martin's that long to publish a book. Mm -hmm. So in, in that interim, um, I, I get a call at home on my home phone. And a um, guy on the other end says, is this Gary K. Wolf? I said, yes, it is. He says, well, this is Roy Disney from the Disney Corporation. And I said, yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Just keep calling me at home on my home phone number. That's rich. I said, who, who is this really? You know, it was one of my friends putting me on. He said, no, no, no. It's really Roy Disney. He said, I just read your book, Who Censored Roger Rabbit? And I'm wondering if you'd be interested in letting Disney turn it into a movie. I said, yeah, right. The book hasn't even come out yet. And he said, well, he said, uh, I got a copy from someone at St. Martin's Press. And what had happened was somebody at St. Martin's Press, I never found out who, and I tried because I wanted to kiss her or him full on the lips. For, yeah. you know, uh, somebody sent a copy of the manuscript over to Disney and said, hey, we think you'd like this book. And they did, and it worked its way up. Eventually got to Roy Disney, and Roy Disney said, yeah, we would like this book. So uh, the book hadn't come out yet. And they wanted to buy it. Now, 
uh, if you if you've read the book, and everybody should read the book. I mean, uh, so far I think uh, five people have read the book. My my mother and my four aunts, but uh, everybody should read the book. Um, the book is is the best book that I do how to write, and it appeals to a reader's imagination. The movie puts it all out on the screen, but in the book, uh -huh. uh, a reader has to conjure things up in their imagination. And uh, uh, for instance, in, in the book, the characters are books from comic books and comic strips, not cartoons like they are in the movie. And uh, they speak in word balloons. They don't speak verbally, they speak in word balloons. So when uh, when Roger Rabbit um, speaks to Eddie, Roger puts up a word balloon, it's and Eddie has balloon. to read what he says. And if Roger turns around, that Eddie either has to learn to read in reverse or has to <laughs> go on the other side. Um, if uh, if a cartoon character kills somebody with a cartoon gun, produces a bang balloon, and you, the bang balloon it has a certain shape and width and uh, it, it falls to the ground and kind of solidifies immediately. And then when you find uh, another cartoon gun, you can produce another bang balloon and you can compare the two bang balloons and see if that was the gun that committed the fire. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, when, when a cartoon character, a uh, comic book character in the book plays the piano, the notes kind of flutter, 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 flutter up into the air. and. Uh, people cut those those floating notes into eight by twelve sheets, and that's where sheet music comes from. So, I, I, you know, I, I had a lot of fun playing with comic book conventions in a real life world. Um, things that that to me were uproariously funny and, and are, uh -huh. um, and um, forced a reader to use his or her imagination. It's not very filmic, you know. I I didn't think there was any way that Disney or anybody could turn that book into a movie. I just didn't think it could be done. But they gave me more money than I made on everything I'd ever written put together. So, you know, if right. they want to try, let them try. So um, they, they started trying in 1980, and uh, for a long time they pretty much proved me right. They really. They didn't have the horsepower either uh, creatively or uh, in the industry to really do this movie the way it, it should have been done and the way I visualized it. And the, the way actually the way they visualized it too, they just couldn't do it. Um, they, they tried, uh, they tried blending live action and animation and uh, it didn't work well because the technology had not yet caught up to the idea. Yeah. Uh, so uh, at one point, Roy Disney came to me and said, what would you think if instead of cartoon characters, we had costume characters like we have at Disneyland? And I thought, oh, I'm going to have Fred McMurray yeah. as Eddie Millian, and, and Haley Mills as Jessica, Dean Jones as the rabbit, and Kurt Russell as, as Baby Hermit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I think that compromises the, the premise just a little bit. So they, they said, yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. So um, I, it, it was a real roller coaster and it was on the downhill slide uh, in 1985 when a couple of things happened. Um, Michael Eisner came in and Roy Disney was forced out. Um, and uh, Michael Eisner brought with him Jeff Kastenberg. The two of them had worked together at Paramount and produced a lot of really wonderful movies. Uh, and of course, when a new team comes into a movie studio, uh, the first thing they do is get rid of all the projects that the studio had going because that was what got the studio in trouble in the first place. And right. you know, the, the reason why Roy Disney wanted Roger Rabbit, the, the, the company needed something like a Roger Rabbit because the company in 1980, 81, 82, they were making B movies that were, that were intended for the second half of a double feature. And you know, there were no more double features. I mean, they were making movies about the nutty professor at Flubber 
yeah. and uh, the black cauldron and uh, the black hole. The black cauldron disappeared down the black hole. So uh, <laughs> they, uh, they really needed something to promote them back into the top tier of, of movie production studios. Mm -hmm. uh, they also had another motive. Uh, their, their, their character of uh, their character stable was getting kind of stale. Um, you know, they had Mickey Mouse, uh, but Mickey had kind of become their corporate spokesmouse. Mm -hmm. And you really couldn't have a lot of fun with him anymore because he was, he was an icon now. Uh, you know, they had Donald Duck. You could have fun with Donald, but nobody could understand what he said. So, um, you know, he was useless. Uh, they needed the characters. They needed Roger Rabbit. They needed Jessica, Baby Herman. Uh, they needed those characters because I don't know if you've noticed or not, but Disney makes a tremendous amount of money uh, selling merchandise with their characters on them. Yeah. So uh, they needed new characters to uh, expand their merchandise line. So, you know, when Eisner and uh, Kassenberg came on, they took a look at everything in production and they killed everything except Roger Rabbit. They kept Roger Rabbit because they realized, just like Roy Disney did, that they needed that movie. They needed it. So um, they did something that nobody at Disney had ever done before. Uh, they brought in an outside producer to produce this movie. Uh, Disney had always used in-house producers and uh, they brought in a, a little known guy that they'd worked with before at Paramount, a uh, guy nobody ever heard of named Steven Spielberg. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I said too. Who? Who is that? So uh, to, to show you the difference Steve Spielberg makes in a movie project. Uh, they brought Steve Spielberg in in 1985. And of course, I mean, he'd already had massive, massive hits and massive successes. Uh, in 1981, 82, Roy Disney went to uh, Warner Brothers and said to Warner Brothers, hey, we're making this live action animated movie. And um, we'd like to have Bugs Bunny do a cameo. We'd like to have Bugs Bunny come on, on screen and just say, what's up, Doc? Light a carrot, carrot say, Neh! and then go off. It would be on screen for 30 seconds. Right. And Warner Brothers said to, Walt, to Roy Disney, get lost. You know, get lost. There's no way that a Warner Brothers character is ever going to be in a Walt Disney movie. That is never going to happen. So uh, five years later, <laughs> Steve Spielberg goes to Warner Brothers and makes the identical request. Okay, we you know, the live action animated movie, Bugs Bunny, Cameo, 30 seconds. And Warner Brothers looked at Steve Spielberg and said, of course, of course, take him, take him. And, and what about Porky Pig? Don't you want him too? And what about Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner? And, and don't forget Sylvester and Tweety Bird and Yosemite Sam. You got to have Yosemite Sam. So Stephen basically walked away with all of the Warner Brothers characters. And I mean, he did have to pay for them, but it was you know, it was ridiculously cheap. I mean, I could have paid for it myself for my paper route money. Um, the only the only um, qualifier uh -huh. was Bugs Bunny. But Warner Brothers regarded Bugs Bunny as a superstar. Right. And so the Bugs Bunny had a contract. He was the only one that actually had a written contract. And the contract stated that Bugs Bunny had to be in every scene with Mickey Mouse because they were co-equal superstars. So you could not have a scene with Mickey Mouse without Bugs. Without so, Bugs Bunny. So, okay. Yeah, so if you look at the movie, you, you will see that they are in every scene together and they have to have the same identical number of words of dialogue. So next time, next time you watch the movie, Mickey, Bugs, exact same number of words of dialogue. All right. Um, so, you know, we got that hurdle done. Um, but it, then uh, then uh, Steve wanted to get a director and uh, he went with Bob Zemeckis. Uh, Bob Z had been offered this project way back in 1981 and had read the book, as had Steven back in 1981, 82. Uh, and Bob, Bob Z always liked the project, but 
didn't think that Disney had enough clout in 80, 82, 83 to pull it off. Mm -hmm. And Stephen came on board. Bob Z said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So uh, Bob Z then, um, um, Bob Z and Stephen wanted a director of animation, someone to oversee uh, all of the animation. And uh, Disney was a little reluctant to bring in an outsider to do that because uh, they thought they had an, enough talent in-house. But uh, Steve said, well, I, you know, I want to bring in a really world-class person here. And um, they looked at a couple of animators. Everybody wanted Chuck Jones. Um, yeah. And uh, Chuck Jones wanted to do it. But at the time, Chuck Jones was elderly. And uh, the, the fear was that this project, this project was going to take five years. And the fear was that, that the workload would be too much for him and it would kill him. And uh, in one of the few cases of Hollywood empathy, they, they finally said, no, we're not going to use Chuck Jones because this might kill him. I mean, usually it's, yeah, hey, well, work him to death, you know, right, <laughs> and yeah. he dies at the animation table. Uh, so uh, Stephen went looking for someone else that was well-known, world-class, and uh, he, he talked to Ralph Bakshi. Uh, and I often wonder what would have happened if Ralph Bakshi had, uh, had taken the lead animation job. I wonder what he would have done with Jessica. I think that would have been uh, something interesting. But Stephen thought Ralph Bakshi was a bit of a goon, so they passed him. And they finally found uh, Dick Williams. And Dick Williams was a uh, uh, American living in Britain, British expat. And um, he had done, uh, he, he had an Academy Award uh, for the Pink Panther, I think two. And uh, so he had the credentials. He had done, uh, he had just finished a series of animated spots for some British beer. And if you go online, look up those spots, uh, they feature a cat with nine lives. And in every commercial, the cat dies and the beer brings him back to life. And if you if you go to to YouTube and see those commercials, mm -hmm. you'll see that he used a lot of the same gags in Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit. Yeah. Uh, so um, Dick then hired animators. Uh, they set him up with a studio in London. He wanted to animate in London, and so they uh, they set him up with a, a London animation studio, Disney London, uh, and he hired animators from all over the world. Uh, the, the Iron Curtain had, was, had dissolved and a lot of those animators were coming out and uh, couldn't get jobs. So uh, he hired animators from all over the world and they were, they were just the, the, the best and the brightest animators that I've ever seen in my life. I mean, they were incredible. Uh, there were times when I would find myself in a room with 35 of the most creative individuals that I'd ever met in my life. And they were all throwing out ideas on how to make my book funnier. And I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, where were you guys and women? When I, was, when I was writing this thing, getting up every morning at four in the morning and writing it at my kitchen table. If you guys had been sitting around my kitchen table back then, you know, I'd have the Pulitzer Prize now. Um, so, uh, you know, the first thing that they wanted to do was um, um, design the characters. And Dick sat down with me and said, all right, you know, what do you see for Roger? What do you see for Jessica, Baby Herman? Um, and uh, Baby Herman was pretty easy. Uh, there were a number of adult baby characters in comic books particularly when I was growing up there, uh, baby Hugo and uh, there was a lot. And baby, baby Herman came pretty easily. Roger um, in my book was originally a brown rabbit because I wanted to differentiate him from, uh, from bugs and from any of the Disney rabbits. Mm -hmm. uh, so I made him a brown rabbit. And uh, Dick said, well, a, a white rabbit is gonna pop off the screen more than a brown rabbit so i'd like to change him to white I, 
you know, no problem. <clears throat> Dick also added the uh, add the top knot, uh, the orange top knot. And um, Dick added the orange top knot to give him a little character. Uh, but basically he wears the same outfit, uh, red overalls, uh, what you see back here, red overalls, yeah. uh, uh, polka dot tie, um, yellow hands, yellow feet. Um, he, he's basically the same same rabbit, except he's, he's white instead of brown. Um, well, then we came to Jessica, and of course, um, going back to my my hometown again, um, the the through some fluke of genetics, the boys outnumber the girls in that town by thirty five to one. So, <laughs> so good luck getting a date if you're the president of the Checkers Club. Okay, right. Uh, and so Jessica in the book was my ideal woman. I mean, she was the woman that I would have dated if I could ever get a date. I mean, she was a combination of Veronica Lake, uh, Marilyn Monroe, Ava Gardner. Um, I based her on uh, Red Hot Riding Hood by Tex Avery. And oh, okay, yeah. Uh, if you if you again go to YouTube, you can see uh, Red Hot Riding Hood cartoons, uh, Swing Shift Cinderella, and I think there's one called Red Hot Riding Hood. Yeah. And you will see that Red Hot is basically the same character as Jessica, very narrow waist, uh, red hair, although Red Hot is swept up. And Dick Williams wanted Jessica to have that very narrow waist in that big uh, chest uh, because he wanted uh, mostly other animators to know that this hadn't been rotoscoped and rotoscoping is a technique that's used in animation where you film a real person or a real couple or a real something doing something mm -hmm. and then you put it on a on a screen and you draw over it and perfectly acceptable technique i mean it was used in cinderella it was used in uh, snow white um it, it, it's used it used a lot especially dancing couples um and, but he wanted people to know that this wasn't rotoscope. So he made her proportions uh, uh, impossible. She has impossible proportions. Um, and uh, in, in later years, whenever studio executives talk to me and they say, so Jessica Rabbit is your idea of the ideal woman. And I say, yeah, absolutely. And they say, well, maybe... Maybe you should stick to writing uh, like uh, war movies or Turkish prison movies where you don't have to deal with the feminine element because you clearly, <laughs> you clearly don't know. So, um, so um, you know, that was taken care of. We had the characters designed. They, they now needed an Eddie Valiant. Um, and everybody wanted Harrison Ford. I mean, Harrison Ford was at the top of everybody's list. When they told him it would take four years to do this, he, you know, he said, I can't do that. So Paul Newman was next and the same deal. He could not, he could not cut out that much time. Uh, so they, they were doing auditions. They had people come in, they had James Woods come in. Uh, actually, Kurt Russell came in. A lot of people came in and finally they found the guy who was the perfect Eddie Valiant. And that, of course, was uh, Bill Murray. <laughs> so they hired Bill Murray to be Eddie Valiant. And it, it, yeah, it became obvious really quickly that uh, Bill Murray was not going to be uh, Eddie Valiant because he, um, he did not seem to believe the rabbit was real himself. And, and so would have a hard time convincing an audience that the rabbit was real. He would look at the rabbit and say, oh, you're a talking rabbit. Uh, so they they bought him out of his contract for $1 million wow. and, yeah, and continued the search. Uh, they kept auditioning. And finally, they found uh, the perfect right, the, the perfect Eddie Elliott. And that, of course, was Eddie Murphy. So Eddie Murphy comes on as Eddie Valiant. And now all of a sudden we're rewriting the script to make Eddie Valiant funnier than the tunes, right? And you know, obviously this is not going to work either. So, uh, so Eddie Valiant, I mean uh, Eddie Murphy, gets bought out of his contract for a million dollars, 
And I believe he got a Ferrari too. So uh, you start to see how you make money in Hollywood. You, you never, you never work. Um, so they continued uh, their auditions. I mean, they interviewed uh, Bill Peterson, who I think probably would have done a nice job. And they, but in the meantime, we're on the other side of Hollywood. Uh, Brian De Palma was making The Untouchables. Yeah, and he really wanted Bobby De Niro for Al Capone, but Bobby De Niro was busy on another project and couldn't do it. So um, De Palma hired a. a, a British guy named Bob Hoskins to be Al Capone. And uh, after about two or three weeks of shooting, Bobby De Niro calls De Palma and says, hey, guess what? I wrapped early. I can be in your movie. I can be Al Capone. So now Bob Hoskins has got a million dollars and nothing to do, right? right? So so they called Bob Hoskins in for a reading. And you know, when they told me he was coming in, I said, this isn't going to work. I mean, why bother? The guy's British. You know, this is the prototypical American private eye. Uh -huh. And, and, and I, you know, I've heard him. I, I, I saw Mona Lisa. I saw the yeah. Long Good Friday. I said, the guy's, the guy's got a British, not just a British accent. He's got a Cockney British accent. He's not going to be believable as, a, as an L.A. private eye. He came in and did the reading and his American accent was unbelievable. I mean, it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And not only that, he was standing there on an empty stage reciting the lines and he made you believe the rabbit was there. Uh, and uh, now he is, he was, is, and ever will be my, my Eddie Valiant. I mean, the, the guy did such an incredible job on that movie. Um, when he was handcuffed to Roger, that if you look at the movie, those handcuffs are on springs. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, he, Hoskins has to remember where his hand is in relation to the rod to Roger's hand because he's actually controlling the movement of Roger's hand by by moving his hand with the handcuffs on springs. Um, when he was thrown out of the Incompinkle by the gorilla, and he landed, um, th that. <laughs> that harness he was in let go a little too soon and he actually landed and broke three ribs and uh, yeah and so we thought oh geez you know we're gonna have to shut down filming for months to let Bob heal it was at work the next day uh, it, it was he was just a trooper and um, you know people say well do you have any regrets about the movie or anything you you know you, you, mm -hmm. you're sorry about and the one thing I'm, I'm sorry about my one regret about the movie is that Bob Hoskins did such a phenomenal job on that movie, most incredible job of acting I've ever seen in my life, and didn't even get nominated for an Academy Award, which he should have won hands down. I mean, but the problem was that he was so good at it that he made it look too too easy. And nobody realized that in 75% of that movie, there was nothing there. It was oh, just him. It's, it's, it's an incredibly seamless performance. Yeah. Um, there were, as um, someone who came up from, from the generation from which that film was huge, we would see Bob Hoskins in a later film, in fact, yeah. and be absolutely stunned when the British accent would come out or the mannerism was different because he's so flawless as that character. Yeah, um, absolutely. It was an amazing absolutely. performance. And, and I think that's an amazing performance. And uh, so then, um, you know, we needed voices. And um, uh, we saw Charlie Fleischer in a comedy club performing. He was actually in London. We saw him performing in London at a comedy club, even though he's, he's an American. He was just on tour. And uh, he was doing a vocal thing of... Uh, Donald Duck having an orgasm. <laughs> so, you know, we brought him in and uh, he worked with, with me and he worked with Dick Williams to come up with a voice for Roger. And Dick Williams believed that every successful animated character had a speech impediment. Uh, you know, Daffy with his the lisp and Donald who can barely talk and Porky Pig. So he wanted... <laughs> He wanted Roger to have a speech impediment of some sort. And it was Charlie who came up with the stuttered P. 
uh, which you know I've now adapted as Roger's standard speaking speaking for us. So uh, they wanted a voice for Jessica. Uh, Bob Z had worked with Kathleen Turner on Romancing the Stone, and so he said, uh, you know, he asked her if she would do it. Well, at this point, nothing had been done yet, and. Um, so nobody really knew, nobody really knew if this was going to be an adult movie or a kid's movie or if it was going to be accepted or if it was even going to be any good. So Kathleen agreed to do the voice of Jessica, but um, she would not take a screen credit. She would do it uncredited, which is what James Earl Jones did with Darth Vader yeah. in Star Wars. Nobody knew if that was going to be any good. So uh, he did not take a screen credit. Uh, if it bombed and well, nobody would know who he was and if it was a huge success he would be the mystery man who did the voice of Darth Vader uh, so she did not take a screen credit so she did all the lines and um, when it came time to sing the song she couldn't sing the song uh, whether she didn't have any breath control and she was pregnant at the time whether she didn't have any breath control or whether she just can't sing out Oh, but uh, Steve Spielberg was there with Amy Irving, who was his wife at the time. And um, so he said, Amy, you know, you sang a gentle, why don't you give it a whack? Mm -hmm. And I said, I said, Steve, nobody's going to believe that Jessica has one voice when she sings and a totally different voice when she talks. And I don't want to even notice. So uh, Amy Irving did Jessica's singing voice. And she did take credit for it. If you read the credits, there is no Kathleen Turner, but there is Amy Irving singing voice of Jessica Rabbit. And nobody ever did know this. So, um, so the, the movie, the movie went into production, uh, took from 1985 to 1988. Uh, the movie was finished and, um, they were going to premiere it at Radio City Music Hall in New York City so that I didn't have to go to the West Coast. So uh, I, I went down to New York City. I live in Boston. So, uh, mm -hmm. I went down to New York City and um, uh, went to the Radio City Music Hall. I sat in the VIP section, which was the first balcony. And um, I, I I realized I was going to see the movie all the way through for the first time. I'd never seen it all the way through because they were still working on it yeah. up, up until the last, um, you know, a couple of weeks when I was in LA, they were still working on it. I had never seen my credit. I was going to see my credit on the screen for the first time. I mean, my name on the screen for the first time. And um, I was sitting in the VIP section and on my left was Kathleen Turner. On my right was Amy Irving, two of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, life just doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and and, it, and then by golly, life got better because Kathleen put her hand on my leg and she leaned over and whispered in my ear and said, Gary, are you excited? <laughs> I said, Kathleen, you have no idea. <laughs> so um, the, the, the movie... Uh, the movie obviously uh, was was a huge smashing success for a movie that uh, they didn't know whether this movie would be an adult movie or a kid movie. It turned out to be an everybody movie. Um, I, we were staying in a hotel that uh, kind of overlooked the Radio City Music Hall. And the next day I looked out the window and I could see Radio City Music Hall. And, and they had started showings at like eight in the morning. And... Uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning, there was a line around the block waiting to get into this movie. Uh, so uh, obviously I, what I wanted to do was check the merchandise and <laughs> see what uh -huh. kind, of, kind of merchandise. And I, I told my wife, I'm going to buy the first piece of Roger Rabbit merchandise I see. Whatever is the first thing I see, that's what I'm going to buy. And uh, so they told me that they had merchandise at Macy's. So we went to Macy's. And um, uh, I asked the, the young woman at the information desk by the door, I said, do you have Roger Rabbit merchandise? She says, yes, we do. And I said, uh, well, could you direct me to it? She says, yes, yeah, second floor. He said, okay, we're on the second floor. She says, no, second floor. So we go up in the entire second floor is Roger Rabbit yeah. merchandise. And, oh and I, I am, 
I am floored by this. I am probably more floored by this than I am by seeing the movie because all of a sudden I realize the enormity of this character and this concept and how life changing this is going to be. Not not just for me, but for popular culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I saw was a Roger Rabbit lunchbox, uh, 398. I, I wish I had seen something else, but that's what I saw and that's what I bought and I still have it. And um, um, I, if I, I went to the Academy Awards the next year. Roger was nominated, won four. Uh, I went to the Academy Awards and uh, sat close enough to share to smell her perfume. Um, I went to the uh, opening in London um, at Princess Di. Uh, this, this was a life-changing experience for me. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, it hasn't gone away. It hasn't faded. Uh, Roger Rabbit, the movie, was just inducted into the uh, Smithsonian Institute's uh, list of well, greatest films in American film history or something like that. Um, the, the characters are still universally known, universally loved. I get Oh, I can't tell you, probably 50 pictures of Jessica cosplayers every month. Um, and honest, that's kind of a thing, yeah. Yeah, and the, and awesome. the, interesting, the interesting thing is that uh, they don't, they, they, at first they were portraying Jessica as she, as she is in the movie, but it's kind of branched out. And now people have kind of taken it as the spirit of Jessica Rabbit. And uh, so I get uh, tall Jessica, short Jessica's, thin Jessica's, uh, buxom Jessica's, black Jessica's, Asian Jessica's. I get male, I get male Jessica's. Male Jessica's. <laughs> you know, great. Bring them on. Uh, the the rainbow color tent of Toontown is big enough to to hold one and all. Um, I think and, that there's a uniqueness to that film that that defies time in a way that a lot of a lot of films don't, because it is. It, it exists in its own microcosm you know what i mean its own universe yeah. it can it can never look old because uh, it's kind of a similar reason like movies like the the was it 1989 batman and a couple of those things they they live in their own little world mm -hmm. and, and you know it, it might be part 30s it might be part modern or something but it all blends together so seamlessly as a coherent world mm -hmm. that that it just endures yeah, I, I do watch, I watch the movie periodically because uh, we have a lot of young friends. My, my fan base has gotten younger. I mean, when the movie came out, uh, the fans were uh, teenagers, not many young children, but teenagers on up. And uh, as those teenagers grew up, the, the movie came out on uh, first cassette and then uh, laser disc and then DVD. Uh, they started using it. They started watching it again and then using it as a babysitter. And they now show it to their younger children. And so my fan base has gotten younger. Uh, and when I, when I go to a show to give autographs, uh, my fan base is young kids all the way up to, you know, people older than I am. And uh, it, it's, it's gratifying to me because I think that Roger... Jessica and, and Eddie Valiant are popular cultural icons. They, they, they'll exist forever. They'll, they'll, they'll outlive me, and that's good. You know, on my, on my tombstone, it will be Gary K. Wolf. Uh, he created Roger Rabbit in Toontown. You know, that'll be enough. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one, one story. Um, when, uh, when Stephen was getting the characters, for the uh, uh, for the movie, and he was getting characters from other studios. He wanted to make sure that all of the key players had their favorite characters in the movie. Uh -huh. And uh, Bob C's were uh, the Roadrunner and uh, Wiley Coyote, and that was a problem because the movie was set in 1946, but they didn't appear in a cartoon until 1947. So you kind of had to fudge them, but they are in there. Uh, Hoskins were heckle and Jekyll. That was no problem. Uh, and so Stephen came to me and said, you know, what, what's your favorite cartoon character? And I said, well, Steve, you know, 
I got Roger, I got Jessica, I got baby Herman. I think I'm covered. He says, I ah, know, we'll do, we'll do something for you too. We got to do something for you. So uh, if you go back and watch the movie, uh, watch the scene where Eddie Valiant drives into Toontown and he's going through the tunnel and all of a sudden the curtain lifts and there's bluebirds and sunshine and singing flowers. Uh, if you look to the left and you got to look quickly because it doesn't stay long, you will see uh, a yellow farmhouse, a red barn, uh, a, uh, a brown fence, a green meadow and a blue cow okay. all alone in the middle of the field. Oh, oh man! Immortalized by Spielberg. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's like a moment of silence worthy. <laughs> what can you say? What can you say? Yeah. Um, and I think that it's it's just an incredible achievement to film, and you've and you've carried on the uh, the characters in your own novels. I have, yeah. I have the right to do uh, written works with my characters, mm -hmm. and so I I did uh, Plugged Roger Rabbit, which is the sequel. Uh, then I just did Who Whacked Roger Rabbit, mm -hmm. uh, which is the third in the series. And I just my pandemic book is uh, Jessica Rabbit: uh, Serious Business, um, which is an origin story about where Jessica came from and how she turned from a poor, uh, unattractive um, um, shop girl into Jessica Rabbit, Jessica Rabbit. So where Roger came from and how Toontown came to be. Uh, so I just finished that during the pandemic. Um, and I'm currently working on a fourth Toontown novel. Well, I guess actually a fifth, I would call it Jessica a Toontown novel. So a fifth Toontown novel, uh, going back to the to the mystery roots it's gonna gonna feature eddie again uh and will be uh, darker and and more noir in character kind of like uh, uh who censored roger rabbit and who whacked roger rabbit um so yeah i mean it it's a career for me <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is i love doing it i mean i could sit here at my desk and write these books forever uh, so that's what i was going to ask next is is how easy is it to slip back into that universe when the... it, it it's really tough it, it's exhausting because in order to write about toontown you have to go to toontown and you have to live there and uh like bob hoskins toward the end of the movie um bob hoskins said that he could see roger rabbit he, he could visualize Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit was there. And according to Hoskins, it was almost six months after the movie was done filming before Roger disappeared. Uh, and I have to do that same kind of thing when I go into Toontown. I have to sit here and shut my eyes and visualize going into Toontown and seeing what, what happens that would not happen if I were going up my front door in downtown Boston, yeah, it's not wow. easy. It's it's exhausting. I can only I can only write for like three hours a day, and uh, my my brain is just fried. It, it it's it's an interesting thought because it's an absurdist universe. Yeah. So so nothing, but the the absurdities in the universe in the universe itself are taken for granted. Yeah. You know I mean? So yeah. and, and, oh, this happens all the time. Thunk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, the problem that I faced in, in the first novel, the second, in every novel I've written, everything has to be consistent. Uh -huh. If it's not consistent, if there's an inconsistency, you're gonna, the reader is going to pick it up and you're going to lose the reader. Um, the same way in the movie. That's, that was the one thing that Bob Z stressed. Everything in the movie had to be consistent with a world where cartoon characters were real. Mm -hmm. So uh, that said, Bob Z came up with a gag, which he thought was so funny that he said, we're going to put this gag in. And everybody said, that's inconsistent with, with cartoon characters in a real world. And, but he thought it was so funny that he said, I'm going to put it in anyway. And he did. And that gag is when Bob Hoskins is in the elevator with Droopy and the elevator goes boom down to the basement. 
Bob Hoskins becomes a pancake on the floor. Yeah. And that that's totally inconsistent with the premise. But Bob Zemeckis thought it was funny, so it stays in. Yeah. Isn't there a there was a there was a droopy cartoon where there's a there's a dog in the in the prison outfit and he and he's running everywhere. I, I, wasn't that a gag from that cartoon? Am I uh probably. I mean <laughs> they borrowed a lot of gags from a lot of places. I I I I I mean these the the animators seem to know every gag from every cartoon, every cartoon. ever made. And uh I think they put like three quarters of them in Frank Roger Rabbit, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's awesome. But yeah, the, the Bob Pancake, the first time you see it, it's like, okay. You know, you expect it from everyone else. It, it, you know, it, it, and again, it's like Jessica having two voices. Uh -huh. uh, people see it, they laugh, and it, it's there and it's gone so quickly that nobody really thinks about it. <laughs> Basically, yeah. But I thought about it. <laughs> it's like, oh, well. Well, is there anything more you'd like to share with our viewers? You got well, anything um, coming up? Yeah. This yeah I, I would like them to uh, check out my website. I just uh, spiffed it. Uh, it's www.garywolf.com. And uh, they can go there. They can buy my books. Uh, they can read my musings. Uh, I just put up a, a bunch of new uh, interviews on there. And um, uh, you can also check me out on Facebook, Gary K. Wolf on Facebook. I, uh, I, I'm approaching my friend's limit. So if you want to, if you want to be my friend on Facebook, you got to hop in, and I'm I'm becoming more and more selective. So you have to make me laugh when uh, when I see your profile. But uh, you know, aside from that, stay tuned because I think there's going to be more Roger Rabbit coming sometime. Awesome, ladies and gentlemen, Gary K. Wolf. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time. It's my pleasure. Thanks a bunch. Sure thing.